Bonnier Bay. Welcome to To the Contrary's annual film festival called All About Women and Girls. This week, we bring you the winner for best documentary about women in U.S. history. In Hello, Girls, filmmaker Jim Ferris brings us the untold story of 223 women sent to France as telephone operators by the U.S. Army to help win World War I. It's about their experiences and their fight for recognition. The Hello Girls Congressional Gold Medal Act of 2018, in support of the women's significant contributions to the U.S. during World War I, was never voted on, but it could be reintroduced in the next session of Congress. I write women's history, and I didn't know the stories of the Hello Girls. I had never heard of them. They were switchboard operators. Home they came, and did they get their veteran status? They did not. All of the things that we have today, all of the things, all of those rights, could come back down to those, those few women who served our country. Aboard at last after two months of preparation in the USA. 32 girls in my charge, youngest 19. One is quite old, 35 I think. We are the only women on board the ship, the former Celtic of the White Star Line. With faces glued to the portholes, we watch the Statue of Liberty fade from sight. What a responsibility I have on my shoulders. I've crossed the Rubicon now. There can be no turning back. Over there, over there. Send the word, send the word over there. That's the Yankee. I guess the first thing you need to know to understand the technology of the telephone system in the 19 teens is all telephone calls required at least one human being, one telephone operator. If a subscriber wanted to make a call, they would pick up the receiver on their telephone. That would send an electrical signal where it would cause a light to flash on a switchboard, and an operator would see that light, plug a cord in to, there would be a jack under the light, and now she was attached to the other end of the line as the subscriber was. She would then say, number please. The subscriber would give her the number of the telephone. If it were a local call, the operator would simply then take another cord, plug it into the jack corresponding to the requested number. It would ring on the bell of the telephone, and either the, so the subscriber would pick up or not. Once the call was complete, she would go on and do another call, and then eventually watch for the light to go out. And when the light went out, that meant that the conversation was done and she could disconnect. The women were recruited from all over the United States, and they came from absolutely every corner. And, uh, and they all were trained in different locales by AT&T. But when Pershing got to Paris, I mean, he wasn't thinking about women, let's recruit women for the Army. He was just trying to do what we all do, which is to pick up the phone and have something happen on the other end. You could wait, on average, 60 seconds for the phone to be connected. Whereas when the women got there, the average time it took to connect a call was 10 seconds. And part of it had to do with simply, as the Army said, women have better nerves. Well, in wartime, that difference, 50 seconds, is the difference between getting killed or not. And so uh, within a few months, Pershing put out the order and he said to, uh, to the U.S. War Department, I want women telephone operators, I want them uniformed. And, uh, and so it took the Army a couple of months. They sent out letters uh, and they got 7,600 letters from women applying for 100 positions. So, you know, half of the men in the U.S. Army volunteered, and all of the women volunteered. Hello, 
Grace Banker had very strong faith. She graduated, she went to AT&T. Got the very best job a woman from Barnard College of Columbia University could get at the time, which was a telephone operator. So she was there until, lo and behold, she saw an advertisement looking for uh, women to serve in the Signal Corps overseas. And, and she, as soon as she read in, in the New York Post that they were looking for women operators, she wrote that very day. And then I think it was January of 1918 said, I, I am very interested and I will, I will serve for the duration of the war. And to her enormous surprise, she was made the leader of the expedition because there weren't women soldiers and therefore there weren't women officers, but they needed women officers. And so they made her the chief operator. Awoke in Liverpool after 12 days at sea. Some American boys were lost. The grip, they say. It's wartime in England. Fish soup and awful barley coffee. The bread, hard as a rock. A few days later, we crossed the Irish Sea. The greenest water I have ever seen. The passage was dangerous. I awoke one morning and in the distance, I saw a lighthouse. The fog lifted and I could see La Harve itself. Finally, France. We took a train to the Hotel Petrograd in Paris. Rooms were assigned and we went to bed. It's midnight and I am so weary. I worry about my girls. Rapidement! Vite! Vite! Levez-vous! Levez-vous! Descendez rapidement au sous-sol! Rapidement! Vite! Vite! At that moment, their officers said, we knew then that they were gonna be okay, because those women did not flinch. The women, they all wanted to go to the front. They wanted to get to as close to the front lines as possible. This was exciting. It was obviously a very serious job, but they just wanted to be in it. And they came back up, and the next day they were ready, you know, we're eager, we wanna start. Let us help. Let's start connecting calls today. Colonel Gibbs called and asked me what I knew about going to the front. I said I knew nothing. I have learned to know nothing in the army. Middle of the morning, we were told to go back and pack up. We were already going forward, further front. Suddenly, the rain stopped and the sun came out. The telephone operators, the Hello Girls, play a significant role in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, the largest battle in American history, both in length but also in size of participants. They're, uh, we're laying messages back and forth. It's a very chaotic situation. When they were at the army headquarters near Verdun in the Battle of Muzarkan, and a German prisoner of war knocked over a, an oil stove, the women's barracks uh, were these wooden tinder boxes that the French had used, and, um, and they went up in flames. What a day. Our barracks burned up along with several others. Great funnels of black smoke, licking tongues of flame. Get what you can out, someone ordered. Lucky our switchboard exchange was moved the day before. The bucket brigade saved it. After we searched for our belongings, my toothbrush came to light in a shoe. They knew that if they stopped their work for even a moment, that some battalion could come under fire, that they would not be able to get communication back to headquarters. The army could not alert the men. And so they kept connecting calls until finally uh, their officers, again, a superior officer ran and said, okay, you have to get out now. When the armistice was declared and they basically the end of the first army for uh, Grace Banker, she ended up 
going to Paris, I believe was the next place. Um, it was kind of, it just fizzled out. And she eventually did end up in Koblenz where she did get the Distinguished Service Medal. And it was just sort of part of the dinner table conversation, very typical 1950s. And so stories would get told and, and part of the joke and sort of casual conversation was my grandmother and grandfather both serving in the army in World War I and chasing each other around France during this romance that they had um, while he was the driver and chauffeur and bodyguard and she was the Signal Corps telephone operator. Having met my grandfather, would get transferred somewhere, partly because perhaps the supervisors were a little concerned about this young love happening. Nevertheless, oh golly, do we really want this unfolding love story? So they would transfer my grandmother somewhere and my grandfather would get transferred. Wonderful stories of the Signal Corps girls because of course the switchboards were the pull cord button things and um, in the evenings, if Jack was over here across France and Addie was over here, the Signal Corps girls who were all in on this romance would plug them in across the switchboards across France so Jack and Addie could talk of an evening. And there was always the joke that they were unplugging the generals and saying, oops, but plugging in Jack and Addie. I have um, February 1st, 1919, permission from uh, the first lieutenant, commanding company officer, giving them permission to be married in France during wartime. February 4th, met Addie at 8.45 a.m., had breakfast and went to the Bureau of Registration, then to mayor's office. 11.25 a.m., married, in French, by the mayor of the 9th District. Married to the dearest and sweetest little girl in the world. And sure am some happy, for I love her with all my heart. As we sailed out of New York Harbor, a young aviator asked me, why are you in that uniform? I looked him straight in the eye. Same as you, I'm on my way to France to help win the war. Well, as she's a flamboyant person, she had to be. She had a lot of energy, a lot of energy. She didn't speak French. And so she didn't join the Hello Girls until July. But they needed her by that time because she was a highly experienced trainer. And especially on those little magneto switchboards that were going to go up into the trenches. And so she trained 60 men one time in three days. And the man said to, in the group as they were assembling, well, when do we get our skirt? You're not going to get one. But think about this, that when you're in the trench with your rifle, you have a rifle. When you go into the trench with your little magneto, you could save a whole battalion. I finally went to see the army doctor. The infection in my toe was severe. He took one look and prescribed cold steel, lanced it without anesthesia, I think he was surprised when I didn't squeal. I got to France a week late. She stayed longer in France. She stayed three or four months longer. She took over as the chief operating officer in the Paris office when uh, Grace Banker didn't want it. And she had a riotously fun time and said that uh, I've always thought of her as one of those soldiers that they talked about, you know, that what are you going to do after they've been to Paris? How are you going to get them back on the farm? You know, and she would say that 
intimate that. She didn't want to go home right away. But then she had to. She was engaged. They were supposed to be getting married. Life was going to intervene. My mother told me something extraordinary. She said, if you live long enough, you're going to have everything come full circle and make sense. So I've painted all my life, and I did paint my mother standing probably right there because that building behind us is in the painting. I played for the troops last night. The YMCA director asked me if I could stay in England. He needed a piano player. I can't, I said. I've been sworn into the army and I'm going to France. At the end, 223 of these women were chosen, and I am very proud to say that my mom was one of them. She was from a very small town, it's from Michigan, from Marine City, and she, had, she was of French-Canadian descent, spoke some French in the house, and had taken lessons from a Jesuit priest. And she was chosen, and it was a great honor for her, because you see her older brother, and here's a picture of her older brother, who was, by the way, a good-looking one. <laughs> That's Wallace Jor, also from Marine City, and uh, they both served. Now, he was with the First Army Quartet, so we all used to tease him. I said, hey, Uncle Wally, your sister was on the front lines. You were singing your way. It's a long way to Tipperary all the way. How did this happen? And my mother, who was a, a pianist or a great piano player, has played for General Pershing. In fact, she said the night of the armistice in 1918, they were all playing. She was probably doing a great job on the piano. The war came to an end so suddenly that people didn't see it happening almost. <laughs> The Hello Girls arrived before most of the Doughboys and left after most of the Doughboys were home because communications are about logistics and somebody has to help get those guys over there and help get them back. So they were discharged when the Army said, you know, you can go now. The last telephone operators left in January of 1920 to come home. And when they came home, they were told, you were never soldiers. Dear Senator Jackson, I am one of the Signal Corps telephone operators who enlisted and were sent to France during World War I to operate Army switchboards. Dear Madam, reference is made to your application of June 16, 1941 for the Purple Heart Declaration. We signed no contracts. We wore regulation uniforms with Army buttons and Signal Corps insignia. The However, members of the Signal Corps Overseas Telephone Unit did not possess military status, but were them. civilian employees. Only Thank males you. can serve. serve Many of our Signal women Corps are gone now. The government need to fear no financial burden. 
to decide. But we one. do want our recognition to which we are the entitled. Has not changed. Inasmuch as you are not a bona fide member of the Army, but served in the capacity of a civilian employee, I regret that you are not eligible. Please, Senator Jackson, will you work on our team? We want our rightful place in history. Sincerely yours, Merle E. Anderson. It was mystifying to the women how they could not have been soldiers when they were told again and again, you're in the Army now. And, uh, and the Army said such things as, um, you know, well, you never took the Army oath. And they said, well, but, you know, in our personnel files, we have you know, evidence of the many oaths they took, you know, oath of loyalty to the U.S. Army, which they took multiple times, especially as they rose in rank every single time they had to take the oath again. And then the Army said, well, you were civilians under contract. And they said, but we have no civilian contracts. We signed no contract. We took an oath. When the Army wrote their regulations, one word, they all realized, those that were still living, one word cost them 60 years. And, and so there were a group of women who persevered, but really their leader became Merle Egan. And Merle Egan was from Montana. And she said, I'm a stubborn gal and I, I can't give it up. And so for years, for decades, they petitioned Congress, they, they got bills introduced into the U.S. Senate, into the House of Representatives, they contacted newspapers and magazines. She went to schools to tell school children so the story wouldn't be lost. She had been organizing the political case and the public relations case, but he said, I think there's something here in the law. And the interesting thing, the key critical piece of evidence ultimately became the uniform itself. And so if the government hands you a uniform and tells you to wear it, the government has made you a soldier. Well, as, as a lawyer, I was focused first on, do we have a case here that we could go to court on? Uh, one of the things they found, and actually the National Organization for Women told Merle Egan, well, Senator Barry Goldwater is working out a bill to acknowledge the women of World War II who were also <laughs> dissed by the U.S. government. So when I learned of this, uh, legislative activity, it seemed like a, a more fruitful avenue. And, uh, and so what happens is that Mark Ho and the National Organization for Women and Merle Egan and Barry Goldwater, uh, and with the help of also Congresswomen like Lindy Boggs. So when she was elected to Congress, uh, one of the women who had been involved with Hello Girls got in touch with her. I got in touch with the two new female members of Congress, my mother and Marjorie Holt and uh, said, here's what's going on, help us. She realized, as do many women who go to Congress, that not only was she representing the second district of Louisiana, she was representing, unbeknownst to her, the women of America. We convinced them to expand that legislation ever so slightly to include the WASPs of World War II and the Signal Corps women of World War I. Today, the few Signal Corps telephone operators of World War I who are still living can celebrate our victory. The Army has finally admitted we are legitimate. In 1917, General Pershing called for American women to enlist to operate the Army switchboards. But when the job was finished, we were told we hadn't been in the Army. More than 50 bills were introduced in Congress without success. In November 1977, a package bill was sent through Congress. We were finally in the Army. On November 23, 1977, President Jimmy Carter signed the legislation. The Signal Corps women of World War I will have their place in history. To be proud, her boys in line. Over there, over there. Send the word, send the word over there. That the Yanks are coming. We hope you found this edition of our All About Women and Girls Film Festival enlightening. Please follow me on Twitter 
and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week.